This is Global Mining News, available worldwide on the internet. Welcome to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Pocabelli, online editor and host. And we've been beating the drum on ESG for what feels like months. And we're actually, rather than pulling back, we're actually going a little deeper because we have two what I'd call world experts from Deloitte that were available to us. They're thought leadership partners at the last Global Mining Symposium. More on that in a minute. So we're actually getting high-end consultation analysis to of Deloitte's top people on ESG. We have Henry Stock, National Leader of Sustainability and Climate Change in Canada, and Andrew Swart, Global Mining and Metals Leader. It's a lively discussion. It's got a lot of energy in it. I, well, I was going through the edits. I was just like, this is a exciting interview. So stick around for that. Global Mining Symposium. I just saw the greatest ad that the Northern Miner has ever done. It's on our Instagram at the Northern Miner. And it's also on our Twitter. Let me just bring it up. I wonder if I can get some, is there audio on this? Hold on. Here it is. Oh, there is. Oh, it's hilarious. Now, just music, but it's a great ad. Really excited and happy to be joined oh. by the CEO of Franco Here Nevada, it is. Paul Brink. How are you doing, Paul? I'm just great. Thank you for including me here. I think it's the obligation of a company to go to where the money is. So the mine plans underpinning the businesses for the next five to 10 years are solid. And so I think that's that's a big part of why transparency is important for the industry. Literally, we can de-risk our industry. We can increase the rate of change. Gold's a financial asset, and in this environment, it's driven by investment demand. I'm just trying to grab investors by the lapels and say, look at this, this is just crazy. Gold, silver, and the miners are really in a, in a stealth bull market at the moment. You can, you can tell that gold is rising in every currency. Connect, learn, and grow November 10th and 12th. That is the greatest Northern Miner ad I have ever seen. Northernminer.com slash GMS 2020. Hats off to the team there. I think that was probably Maladin, whoever that was. You guys have stepped it up. Is this only a trade newspaper? Is that all we're doing over here? A very, very impressive situation from the marketing team. Check it out. It's a very exciting, dramatic ad. Anyway, so we have news. There is the Global Mining Symposium is November 10th and 12th. So it is only two days this time. We take a break for Remembrance Day. And maybe it's nice to have that day in between as well. And so, again, that is at northernminer.com slash GMS. If you go there, you'll see the ad for yourself. We also have it posted there. And it's only in one month, seven days, and 11 hours. So register for free. If you want to sponsor, there is a big orange button. And speakers to be announced. So watch this space. I think we're going to go quarterly. I think that's what we're doing here with the Global Mining Symposium. So it's pretty cool. Just stay right on top of things there. So... That is happening. We also have JP Morgan. I mean, I find this fascinating. And the gold bugs and silver bugs have been saying for, I almost want to call the alt finance community, has been saying since at least 2009 that the precious metals markets are being manipulated. It became a point of contention, a place of conspiracy. And interestingly, I mean, people like Jeffrey Christian, I want his commentary on this story that came out because the SEC has fined JP Morgan $920 million for market manipulation in the precious metals and treasury markets. And so any of our reporters that have Jeffrey Christian's email, I would love to hear his commentary on this. So we're going to take a look at that story Uh, There's the Trump rare earth thing. I mean, other Trump news other than the mega corona news. There's he declared a national emergency on rare earths production. Now, that sounds a little dramatic. I think the reason they do that is more technical than anything, which is then he can put an executive order out and get some actions because it's a national emergency. With Canadian aluminum exports, there's a national (laughs) emergency. So 
you know, take the headline with a grain of salt on that side, but it is what it is. It is a declaration of national emergency on rare earths. As we know, China dominates that market. And so I think the U.S., especially after COVID and uh, concern about supply chains, wants to do something about it. So lots of interesting news. We also have metal prices, which continue to be interesting, very interesting time in the market, isn't it? There's the uncertainty. Like to me, this is the climbing the proverbial wall of worry. The market is climbing the wall of worry. Everybody's worried. What if there's uncertainty at the election outcome? But now you're seeing stocks are starting to climb and it seems to be on a Biden win, a clear win. So all very, very, very interesting. The fear is, is that we get huge volatility. In other words, the market goes down dramatically on uncertainty in the election outcome. President Trump does something unpredictable and we have a full-blown constitutional crisis. If we get a full-on win from the Democrats, as you see, the polls are pretty extreme. We may have certainty. So the bullish case in Pokebelly land is growing. It's looking like a buy. Who knows? This is an investment advice, but just on a sentiment basis, it looks like it, the market is climbing the proverbial wall of worry. So lots to look at today and lots of excitement. So if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. Find us on Instagram at the Northern Miner. Check out that great ad. It's also on Twitter at Northern Miner. And you can also find us on Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube where we host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available. And now let's turn to Gord Sosinski with the latest from PetroCanada Lubricants on the best way to service our mining machines on the mine site. Joining me once again is Gord Sosinski, Senior Technical Services Advisor for PetroCanada Lubricants. Gord, welcome back. And tell me, uh, how does selecting the right lubricant help protect equipment when it's idling uh, on the mine site for a long time? That's a really good question because in many circumstances, idling is a necessity because of the operating environments we work in and the duty cycles which we operate under. In cold weather, to try and stop idling and reduce fuel consumption, we need to select a lubricant that will offer superior low temperature startup characteristics so you can shut the unit down if you can and it'll restart easily. Conversely, in hot temperatures, we need to select a product that offers good viscosity retention, shear stability and low volatility to provide protection at higher temperatures when the unit is running. You have to idle in all seasons, mostly for driver safety and comfort, so there is no easy out other than product selection to handle the temperature extremes and the related fuel contamination. It's inherent to most engines that the longer you idle, you will introduce some fuel into the oil. So having that viscosity retention so that it's able to protect the engine is still very important. So this is a situation where a synthetic could be used as an all season lubricant across a wide temperature range. But prior to looking for alternative products, consult with your lubricant manufacturer to determine the best product for the operating conditions. And again, lubricant selection is very important. It must work for you. It must also allow you to maintain your idling policy no matter where you operate. Okay, that is very interesting. The sort of thing that you might not think of if you're going into development and about the idling time. How much of an issue is idling time uh, on mine sites? We find that especially in mobile equipment that's in production, so haul trucks and, and graders and things that are out uh, maintaining the roads, they do idle significantly longer than the other. Well, mostly they're running 24 hours, uh, except for ship change and, and stopping at the Lube Islands and things like that. But it is a problem and we do see fuel contamination in a lot of the engines. And it historically has become a bit of a problem now with the technology advances in engines today. We don't see it as much, but Inherently, the longer you idle, the more fuel you can see introduced to the crankcase. So interesting. So we might say there is an environmental component to choosing the right lubricant. Absolutely. If you can shut your component down between ship change or leaving it for service at the service bay and restarting it without promoting any more engine wear, there will be an environmental component that you can save in that respect. Excellent. So it's well worth people checking out uh, Petro Canada lubricants, not just for the cost savings, but for the environmental savings. 
Absolutely. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Gord. That was a really fascinating eight episodes on what's going on with PetroCanada lubricants and how people can really improve their mine operations, save money and save the environment at the same time. Thanks, Gord. Good luck on your work and keep us updated. Thanks, Adrian. And that wraps up our eight episode mining minute series with Petro Canada Lubricants. And we'd just like to thank them once again for supporting this show. And we'd like to thank Gord as well. He's a very nice, interesting guy. And you can check out their Petro Canada Lubricant calculator. Just go to the show notes and reach out to Gord and Petro Canada Lubricants. And you will find all sorts of ways of saving money if you're running a mine. On to the news. And turning to the website, I'm going to start with this uh, J.P. Morgan $920 million fine. And the investigation was by the Department of Justice, the CFTC, and the SEC that say that J.P. Morgan was tied to manipulations of precious metals and treasury markets. I mean, this has been an ongoing debate for more than 10 years, but at least 10 years since I've been paying attention. And what's so funny about it is it really resolves in the gold bug camp. And I don't use the word gold. I know it's thought of as a pejorative term. I say it as an endearing term. Like James Dine says, I'm the original gold bug. You know, I, I, I like the term. I think there's nothing too pejorative about it. But nevertheless, it gets used that way once in a while. It's not meant like that here. Anyways, so point for them, I, I'm just like, because... I mentioned Jeffrey Christian in the intro because I think that Jeffrey Christian, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but my sense was that he thought this was kind of the province of conspiracy theorists, right? So, I mean, and I mean, Jeffrey Christian, as you know, if you listen to this program, I think he's excellent with his what I call sober assessment of metal prices, but sober, but pretty accurate and pretty uh, lucid. And he's a pragmatic, practical guy, so I'm just dying to hear what he has to say about that. So anyways, very interesting development there. We have an editorial on it. Let's just dig that up. And that is coming up in this week's issue of the Northern Miner, which is heading to press tonight. After a lengthy investigation, the Commodities Future Trading Commission in the U.S., also known as the CFTC, has Find J.P. Morgan Chase and Company and its subsidiaries, J.P. Morgan Chase Bank and J.P. Morgan Securities, $920 million for market manipulation that took place over nearly eight years. Now, the conspiracies are older than eight years, or the, uh, the allegations are actually older than eight years. I think it's worth mentioning. But it's basically been since the end of the bull market, right? Because I believe that was in 2011 when we hit the last all-time high. The fine is the largest in the CFTC's history and with any luck will discourage rogue trading behavior in the future. Again, this is an editorial. According to the CFTC, and this is Trish Saywell, by the way, our editor-in-chief. According to the CFTC, from at least 2008 through 2016, okay, so that's eight years. Oh, this goes to 2008. So this really does encompass the last blow-off top in gold, the last previous high. Now, you have to wonder how effective their market manipulation was if we hit an all-time high in 2011. Continuing on, so this took place from 2008 to 2016, where traders on J.P. Morgan's treasury's desk placed orders on one side of the market that they had no intention of ever executing in order to create the illusion of buy and sell orders to affect prices. The practice, called spoofing, has been prohibited since 2010, after it was banned under the Dodd-Frank financial reform law. So this actually used to be legal, and it sounds like they started for Dodd-Frank. And, you know, sometimes these financial regulations, it's up to these people running these financial institutions of whatever size to do your homework and know the law. As they say, ignorance of the law is not an excuse. But you see how they started it before it was the law. Sometimes these things are so complicated, people don't get the memo, and I am not defending them on this, but I'm just trying to understand, it, you know, when you look at those dates, you go, oh, maybe they didn't know. And it doesn't make it any less immoral, say in 2008, if it was legal back then, 
Anyways, continuing on, the CFTC stated in a September 29th press release, JPM, through numerous traders on its precious metals and treasuries trading desk, including the head of both desks, placed hundreds of thousands of orders to buy or sell certain gold, silver, palladium, platinum, treasury note, and treasury bond futures contracts with the intent to cancel those orders prior to the execution. And it continues, through these spoof orders, the traders intentionally sent false signals of supply or demand designed to deceive market participants into executing against other orders they wanted to fill. According to the order, in many instances, JPM traders acted with the intent to manipulate market prices and ultimately did cause artificial prices. And so JP Morgan Securities, LLC, is being charged with failing to identify, investigate, and stop the misconduct, because that's their job, adding that despite numerous red flags, including internal surveillance alerts, inquiries from the CME and the CFTC, and internal allegations of misconduct from a JPM trader, JPMS failed to provide supervision to its employees sufficient to enable JPMS to identify, adequately investigate, and put a stop to the misconduct. The financial penalty is broken down into three parts. JP Morgan must pay $436.5 million in fines, significant amount, $311 million in restitution, and more than $172 million in disgorgement. CFTC chairman Heath Tarbert said, quote, spoofing is illegal, pure and simple. This record-setting enforcement action demonstrates the CFTC's commitment to being tough on those who intentionally break the rules, no matter who they are. And further, the derivatives regulator noted that the manipulative and deceptive conduct, quote, involved hundreds of thousands of spoof orders in precious metals and U.S. Treasury futures contracts on the commodity exchange. I mean, U.S. Treasuries. If you're manipulating those, that is, I mean, full faith and credit of the U.S. government, right? On these U.S. Treasuries bonds. I mean, manipulating the U.S. Treasury, the bond market, that actually sounds like a small fine when you consider some of the implications there. That's almost a bigger deal than the precious metals aspect. I mean, us gold and silver people are all jumping up and down, pointing at what's going on here. But the treasury market, I mean, what, how big of a manipulation was that and which direction? And we have a further quote from the CFTC. The order finds that JPM's illegal trading significantly benefited JPM and harmed other market participants. James McDonald, the director of CFTC's Division of Enforcement, noted that the record monetary penalty, quote, sends the important message that if you engage in manipulation and deceptive trade practices, you will be caught, punished, and forced to give up your ill-gotten gains. Some observers said that the bank's response was half-hearted. We have a quote from J.P. Morgan's co-president, Daniel Pinto, who said in a statement, quote, the conduct of the individuals referenced in today's resolution is unacceptable and they are no longer with the firm. We appreciate that the considerable resources we've dedicated to internal controls was recognized by the DOJ, including enhancements to compliance policies, surveillance systems, and training programs. That's the JPM response. And now we have a critic, Better Markets, who is based out of Washington, D.C., and they're a nonprofit organization which is founded after the 2008 financial crisis. And they said the, quote, sweetheart settlement was little more than a slap on the wrist, end of quote, and the fine amounted to, quote, little more than 10% of what the bank made in the last three months of 2019 when it earned a total of $36.4 billion. So critics say it's a slap on the wrist. It's hard to disagree. But, you know, like these banks, it's too big to fail. How badly can the CFTC now come down on J.P. Morgan? What happens if you really find J.P. Morgan? And banks haven't been doing particularly well in this market. And on whose orders? I mean, the conspiracy continues on who was asking J.P. Morgan. Was it just rogue traders, as they seem to suggest? So the conspiracy doesn't end. Some food to chew on for the next 10 years until the next announcement. Moving along, and staying in the U.S., Trump has declared a national emergency on rare earths production, and this is by Cecilia Jamazmi of Mining.com, and this actually got quite a lot of traction on our Twitter feed. 
It's really interesting. There is actually quite a bit of interest in rare earths. I mean, it doesn't hurt that the most controversial man in the world is involved in this story, but nevertheless, I've noticed there is traction on rare earths. People are paying attention, and I think it does have a lot to do with this concern over China and just geopolitics in general. Turning to the story, U.S. President Donald Trump has signed an executive order declaring a national emergency in the mining industry, a move that seeks to curb the country's reliance on rare earths in his latest bid to end China's control of the market. The directive issued late Wednesday night, this was written on October 1st, so in late September, asked the Interior Department to explore the 70-year-old Defense Production Act to speed up mines development. It also calls for a report evaluating possible measures such as tariffs, quotas, or other trade restrictions targeting China and other non-market foreign adversaries. Critical minerals have been the focus of the Trump administration. The White House has signed an agreement with Canada and Australia, among other nations, to secure a supply of minerals needed for a range of modern life's aspects, including electric vehicles, green technologies, and military applications. And don't forget we had that story on the EU which is also trying to secure critical metals, including lithium. And there was another story related to this that just came out yesterday. U.S. grabs stake in battery metals miner to fight Chinese control. Also by Cecilia Jamasmi. She's on the geopolitical beat. Good for her. It's a fascinating one. The U.S. government is taking a $25 million equity stake in Dublin-based battery metals miner TechMet as part of a push by President Donald Trump to reduce the country's reliance on supply chains dominated by China. The backing from the $60 billion U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. Like, what does this mean? The U.S. is going into resource nationalism? Is like, Are they going to start? Is the U.S. government through the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation going to start buying mines? Wow. You know, maybe something to look for if Trump gets reelected is really getting aggressive on this resource nationalism theme. So together, the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation and TechMet will develop a nickel and cobalt mine in Brazil. And it says here both metals are key to production of the batteries that power electric cars and cell phones. TechMet's Brazilian nickel project in the northeastern state of Piauí is estimated to hold as much as 72 million tons of nickel and cobalt. And so this company is based out of Dublin, but they have this mine that's in Brazil. So we're all over the world here on this story. And the chief executive of the government agency, in other words, the International Development Finance Corporation, Adam Baylor, says investments in critical materials for advanced technology support development and advance U.S. foreign policy, end quote, the move follows last week's executive order declaring a, quote, state of emergency in the U.S. mining industry. Okay, so that's what we just talked about. So this is the follow-on story, right? So the directive which seeks to advance domestic battery metals industry also called for a report evaluating possible measures such as tariffs, quotas, or other trade restrictions targeting China and other non-market foreign adversaries. You can almost put these two articles into one. Continuing on... And ladies and gentlemen, I have late-breaking news. David Rosenberg, the famed economist, Rosie, Rosie Econ guy on Twitter, will be at the Northern Miners Global Mining Symposium this November 10th and 12th. He will be on one of the days. Global Wall Street, take heed. David Rosenberg is going to be on the Northern Miners Global Mining Symposium. Great news. Once again, great work by the team at the Northern Miner to get just the best guess you can hope for. If you want to sign up, I think you can even ask questions. I mean, that's a pretty rare opportunity to ask David Rosenberg questions. So sign up today, northernminer.com slash GMS. And with that, back to our stories. What do we have next year? So Newmont and Agnico Eagle are teaming up in Columbia and I just wanted to touch on this because it's kind of interesting. Newmont seems to be making little partnerships here and there. Uh, Newmont, the world's largest gold producer, this is by Cecilia Jamasmi, is joining forces with Agnico Eagle Mines in a 50-50 joint venture in Colombia to explore the mid-Cauca belt in the country's northwest. 
The partners will focus on the Anza Gold Project, in which Newmont has earn-in rights, as well as other prospective gold targets of district-scale potential in Colombia. You know, what's interesting about this team-up, I think Ignico Eagle, it shows their maturation as a company that they're going into 50-50 JVs with Newmont. That really is. Ignico Eagle is really breaking into that first tier. If we remember right from the Global Mining Symposium where Sean Boyd was on, the chief executive officer, he was saying that Ignico is around a 2.1, 2.2 million ounce producer. Newmont, I think, is around six or seven. I think it's six, but it could be seven. So nevertheless, you see Ignico Eagle, they were already in the big leagues, but now they are really uh, getting big here. So just wanted to touch on that. Another one I just want to touch on, Australia's Queensland state approves of a giant coal mine project. And also by Cecilia Jamasmi, Mining.com. Authorities in Queensland have granted Pembroke Resources a mining lease for its $710 million U.S. Olive Downs mine, which is poised to become the state's third largest coal operation. So interesting, a coal mine opens in Australia. Continuing on, uh, we have a new report from Ernst & Young, and they're saying, and this directly relates to our main feature content, license to operate, still top concern for miners. And what you're going to hear later is Deloitte is saying the same thing. ESG is the top concern for mining companies. So you see how we've been beating the drum on this for a year now, and it's just becoming more important. So it's really, it was center stage before, now it's undeniable. Like we're seeing survey after survey, it's quite clear the mining industry is really seems to be focused on getting everything worked out on an ESG front. And I think that can only help the industry. And so quick look at this uh, survey with 250 executives. The report shows 63% of executives view license to operate as the biggest risk facing their business as stakeholder expectations evolve up from 44% last year. It's funny to hear it described as a risk. Uh, but anyway, uh, the departure of Rio Tinto's Jean-Sébastien Jacques over the destruction of ancient Aboriginal heritage sites in Australia has put mining executives globally on notice. And Ernst & Young says miners will need to work with governments and sector associations to help shape the messaging of the societal contribution and value derived from the mining sector. And again, I don't want to belabor this because we're going to actually go deeper into that in our feature content, but I did want to highlight it because you see this is more than a trend here. Again, we have a commentary, Andrew Cheadle, special to the Northern Miner, a higher purpose, mining's crucial contribution to the sustainable development goals. And those are United Nations sustainable development goals. Yeah. So Andrew Cheadle, former I think he was former president or CEO, maybe both, of the PDAC, the Prospectors and Development Association of Canada. He's been writing, I don't know if it's a regular thing, but he seems to be writing regularly for the Northern Miner every few weeks. I don't want to overstate that, but yeah, we're getting some really great contributors. We also got Dr. Chris Hind is contributing bi-weekly. So really interesting content coming exclusively to the Northern Miner. So I just point that to your attention. It's on the northernminer.com. Uh, you can see it on the homepage, about five or six stories down. I want to finish on this metal story. Platinum and palladium could boost performance of lithium-ion batteries. Palladium is rocket launched, and so I really have my eye on platinum. It's sort of the metal that nobody's talking about as far as the precious metals. Gold people have been talking about, silver people have been talking about, palladium last year with its really parabolic move, and now it's, it's back up. Platinum, to me, is a really undertold story. We have a story by Carly Williams, our senior reporter and science reporter. And here it is. Lion Battery Technologies is pushing forward with plans to develop lithium-ion batteries that use platinum and palladium to enhance battery performance. You see how young this technology is. I mean, battery technology has been around for a long time, but you see, like, they're still trying stuff out. It's in a very experimental stage. It's if they're, you know, okay, let's try this new metal. <laughs> So uh, just a background on Lion Battery Technologies. The company was formed as a joint venture between Platinum Group Metals and Anglo-American Platinum, the world's largest producer of PGMs, and aims to accelerate development of the next generation battery technology that uses PGMs, including platinum and palladium. 
And so just a little more background. In July 2019, the two PGM miners invested a total of $4 million in the venture with the Lion Battery Technologies receiving exclusive rights to the partnership's intellectual property. So they must have a patent on this. The mining companies will lead the efforts to commercialize the technology. And a little bit on the science of this, and we have a quote from Michael Jones, Platinum Group Metals president and CEO, who said in an interview, quote, the major demand for palladium and platinum is in catalytic converters in gasoline-powered vehicles. So we knew that. This represents about 84% demand for palladium and some 35% demand for platinum. And here's the twist. However, if you study PGMs, you realize that they are exceptional metals that encourage chemical reactions but don't participate in them. At a high level, a battery is just a chemical reaction in a box. So the logical question is, why wouldn't these great catalysts play a role in improving this chemical reaction? Jones noted that he'd been thinking for some time about the role of PGMs as a catalyst in chemical reactions and what that might mean for storing energy in batteries. After searching on Google... <laughs> Maybe when we search on Google sometime, we'll also create companies and make patents and get bought out by other companies. Anyways, so big moves in the battery space uh, with that. And platinum and palladium look like they may be able to take advantage of that. So with that, let's take a look at metal prices and see what's going on over there. Prices. We'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on October 6th, gold is trading at $1,911.36. That is $30 higher than last week's quote. Silver is trading at $24.30 per ounce. That is... 68 cents higher than last week's quote. Platinum is trading at $897.73. That is $14 higher than last week. And palladium is trading at $2,357.76 per ounce. And that is $96 higher than last week. Copper has fallen $0.05 cents to $2.91 per pound. Aluminum is down a penny at 77 cents per pound. Lead also is down 2 cents at 80 cents per pound. Nickel is down a penny at $6.47 per pound. Tin is 21 cents higher at $7.96 per pound. Cobalt is 2 cents lower at $15.39 per pound. And zinc is 3 cents lower at $1.04 per pound. So a pretty clear move higher in the precious metals, really recovering from the big pullback. And industrial metals are taking a breather and pulling back a little bit. Copper is really pulled back from its $3.10 from, from two weeks ago. Now it's at $2.91. Uh, so they're taking a breather after their big run up that peaked two weeks ago. So precious metals up industrial metals down, and those are your metal prices. And coming up, our deep dive into ESG with two world experts from Deloitte, and they were thought leadership partners on the last Global Mining Symposium. And we are going to be joined by Henry Stock, National Leader of Sustainability and Climate Change in Canada, and Andrew Swart, Global Mining and Metals Leader, and this is a firecracker of an interview, and I consider it another essential interview for mining executives, and really what we discuss here is moving beyond this greenwashing, you know, putting up a fancy page on your website saying how committed you are to the environment, and really what you are faced with today as a modern mining company and the expectations and the fast pace of change. I hope you enjoy it and we will see you on the other side. So join 
joining me today, we have two special guests from Deloitte. We have Henry Stock, National Leader of Sustainability and Climate Change in Canada, and Andrew Swart, Global Mining and Metals Leader. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great to be here, Adrian. Great. Good to have you. And so we're here to talk a little bit about ESG, and Deloitte has been doing some work on this. Andrew, can you tell us what are the broader trends going on in ESG right now from Deloitte's perspective? Over the last couple of years, we've seen a, a broader trend or a shift in this particular direction. And it really has, um, if we look at the heart of it, is a, an expectation for mining companies to go kind of well and beyond their sort of general compliance uh, type activities. And so actually a few years ago, we coined a phrase, you know, value beyond compliance. Um, and I think this ties in really closely with, with ESG. And so every year we release our top t trends in, in mining. And this year, probably our, our, well, our leading trend was the whole concept of, uh, of ESG and the pressure that mining companies are, are really facing. And I think what this really represents is a, a continuation or a building of this broader trend of value beyond compliance, which we've been, been highlighting for a while. What's critical about it is that there is now a significant portion of the invested capital base that's actually tied to ESG principles. In fact, you know, estimates out there are somewhere around a quarter to maybe even a third of the invested capital um, is attached to ESG principles. And so it's really got to the point now where it's not just about perhaps a company's purpose or expectations on the part of a community or a host government, but it's also now very much the expectation on the part of investors. And so how companies respond and how they think about actioning ESG, environmental sustainability and governance principles, and putting that into place is, is critical if they want to remain within those invested capital pools. So what you're saying is it, it might have been a nice to have five years ago, but now it's a need to have. It's, uh, you don't really have much choice. It's a shocking number, and it's shocking how fast it goes. But you said up to a third of investment capital. I mean, so it's, it's happened quite fast, hasn't it? Maybe Henry, why did you come in here? Because I mean, certainly from a from a you know national sustainability perspective, like you're on the ground with clients who are, are struggling with this particular issue. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. It, it has um, it has shifted really quickly, and, and I think the numbers you referenced are just testament to the change that investors are looking to see. And, and Adrian, to your point, it is it's staggering how quickly things have changed. M mining companies have been dealing with ESG issues and, and environmental issues, social issues for for many many years. It's not new to them. And uh, the, the difference really is from an investment perspective. The interest from the investor community has significantly shifted from being just that, from being interest to now actually looking for action and commitments and evidence of action and commitments. And that is quite, quite a shift, quite a change. I think if you look over the last few years, what has led to that, it's everything from in, you know, in 2015, we saw the Paris Climate Accord and we saw significant uh, commitments and, and level of understanding of the crisis we have. Uh, of rising carbon emissions in the world. And so that was a real turning point. After that, we saw the establishment of something called the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. And that was another big uh, uh, turning point where financial institutions now had to actually think through their investments and map back their exposure and really stress test uh, what they're doing with their money, with their clients' money. And that obviously trickled down to industries like mining pretty heavily. And then if you just look at other other incidences, uh, this, the, you know, significant tailings, failures and, and disasters, Brumadinho, for example, one was in the news globally, a big disaster uh, a couple of years ago in Brazil. And, and of course, even more recently, we've seen uh, a mining CEO resign over you know, mining through indigenous land without necessarily going through due process to actually consult and engage. And so all of these things build up and lead us to where we are today. 
And the net result is that the level of sophistication that you need to be applying to managing ESG issues as a mining company has radically shifted. And so the sophistication of the investors who are looking for that has changed and their expectations have, has changed as well. And that's across the board in terms of uh, the commitments that mining companies are making, the programs in place to achieve those commitments, and then how they're actually reporting and disclosing on their progress uh, around those commitments. So that that's really what, uh, as a modern mining company today, you're faced with. And ultimately, it, it changes the game in terms of who you have managing these issues inside your company and, and just the, the ways you're doing it, the actual mechanisms, the, the processes, the technology, uh, and the actual way that you're going to achieve those commitments and demonstrate that you're uh, that you're actually performing properly. And Henry, I mean, I think it'll also be fair to say that it's it's very much a global phenomena, right? And because capital is global, and you went yeah. back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, the whole focus around sustainability issues was more kind of regionalized or you know localized. But now the expectation and the transparency that is required by investors um, is very much global. And so it really doesn't matter where you're mining around the world, you are still expected to have this really high bar on, on how you disclose, how you report, and what systems and processes you're actually putting in place. Absolutely. I think that was something that, again, a decade or more ago, if you were head office in Canada or the UK or the US, but you had operations somewhere in Africa or, uh, you know, Papua New Guinea or somewhere that was perhaps more remote and, and not necessarily as developed that you could operate there to those standards. And in many instances, those countries had either no standards or, or very simple or basic standards around operating uh, a mine. And the reality is today, if, you know, it doesn't matter where you're operating, the expectation on performance related to environmental and social issues uh, is extremely high and no different. So I think that that has changed the game as well. And I think that inherently makes it difficult for very large organizations actually large and small, frankly, it makes it very difficult for them to consistently apply the same standards and demonstrate that they're actually being followed uh, as strongly uh, as, as, you know, in, as, in, across all jurisdictions that it's being strongly followed. And I think that's the challenge as well. You know, you touched on an uh, interesting challenge. Like, it sounds like this isn't easy for CEOs, like especially, like you mentioned, large and small companies. Like, how does a junior or a mid-tier even mining, like, how do they do this? Like, what do they do? Like, do, do they just hire a ESG specialist? Like, what are the practical steps that say, what does yeah. a CEO have to do? I think, I think fundamental to, again, irrespective of the size of your organization, fundamental to how you operate in a transparent and, and um, authentic way is to have people who actually engage uh, with your key stakeholders. And, and of course, you know, a key stakeholder is an investor, but probably more importantly are your fence line communities, your stakeholders around where you operate, uh, the people you employ, uh, the local governments. Those are the, the individuals and, and groups that you need to be engaging with. And ultimately, it's pure relationship management, uh, having them understand the way you mine, the methods you employ, uh, your safety protocols, and really becoming a member of their community in terms of how you uh, how you contribute. And I think without that, it doesn't matter how much investor relations spend or expertise you may have, but you can't make up uh, any kind of stories around performance in the field if you don't have performance in the field. And so it starts fundamentally with having people who are in the communities and around the communities that you operate uh, so that you can understand what their concerns are and address them. But as I said, really become a partner in that area to help them kind of develop, grow, and be successful as well. Henry, another sort of a, a I guess, a broader trend that we've um, sort of increasingly see in different parts of the world is mining companies collaborating around community and stakeholder issues um, at a more sort of regional level, right? And so you went back again five, ten years ago, you'd often find mining companies would kind of do their own thing, like run their own programs, etc. But there being uh, a couple of great examples in the last few years where, uh, particularly in amongst more of the majors, they've actively got together with 
their sort of, you know, I guess mining companies and neighboring properties and saying, hey, we're all serving roughly the same sort of community. You know, how do we pull out resources and think about this as a collective whole? And I sort of do wonder, I go back to Adrian's point here on particularly the junior sector, which may not have a lot of the resources of, uh, of the major mining companies, whether or not there is an opportunity for them to also be collaborating with other junior mining companies who are operating in a similar region um, and share or pool or sort of think collectively as to how they might meet some of those particular standards. Absolutely. And I mean, I think it's a great point. And I think even at the most basic of levels in terms of, you know, pooling resources to respond to certain emergencies that could occur, even at that basic level, that's obviously, you know, in, in a disaster or, or potential disaster situation where they could pool together. But I think the more proactive approach around driving change, regional economic change, regional environmental change, I think uh, there's a real opportunity for them to come together in certain areas uh, and collaborate for the better of the industry, frankly. Uh, and ultimately to to uphold that relationship that I referred to earlier, that social license that they all look for, they all thrive to achieve. You know, what, what's critical, I think, in this in this whole discussion, I think particularly for companies that you know, haven't yet uh, ascribed to these particular principles, is to realize that it's not just about putting out a, you know, a glossy document um, and putting it out on your website. I think years back, uh, it was probably a, a good enough step. But now I remember sitting at a at the IMARC conference in Melbourne last year and sort of talking to uh, one of the major global investors in, in mining is a private equity firm, actually. But really, I think the message was, gee, it's not just, you know, we don't just look at the report. We actually expect to be able to go underneath the covers and really have a look and see how this is driving towards action. What sort of processes, what sort of checks and balances and controls do you have in place under some of these things? And I think that's probably where I guess the rubber really hits the road. And it's probably the biggest shift that's really sort of taking place from an expectations perspective. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think just generally the broader environmental and social space hasn't had the luxury of focus and, and budget in terms of modernization from an underlying technological perspective in the same way that, say, the finance function typically does or the human resources function typically does uh, or, or obviously operations do. And so there's a bit of catch up to be made in terms of how companies are managing these environmental and social issues uh, in terms of the actual uh, intelligence from a data perspective and using analytics smartly uh, all the way to be able to look at real-time information to to actually intervene and make management changes over time. And so, again, it's not that the topic hasn't been managed for many years, but the sophistication around it is now rapidly increasing and the expectations increasing, as you just described, from investors like that to do more. And, and I think another, another piece that layers onto that and, and even drives the need for again, this higher or, or more sophisticated, perhaps uh, a lot more digital and connected way of operating is the level of commitments being made. And I think if you look at the, the decarbonization space, the climate change space, many large, certainly large mining companies are committing to a, a net zero target. And any kind of target that you make that you publicly disclose, uh, again, that's when investors get interested. That A, they want to see that you are making those kinds of commitments, but B, once you've made them, they want to understand that there is a roadmap that that you've actually done modeling around your emissions, that you can look at the impacts as you either divest or grow from a financial perspective. And, and for that, there's a level of uh, technological sophistication that's required. And so I think that's the steep curve that we see right now in the ESG and the sustainability space is the way that the issues are being managed on site and at head office and the connectivity between them is from a digital perspective, radically shifting and evolving very quickly. On that point, are there a clear set of defined standards that a company can check off and a follow-up to that is are these standards staying static or are they evolving and and if they are where are they going so yeah it's a great question yeah, it's a great question. There's a, a real plethora of standards out there. I mean, there are a couple of, of bodies. Uh, so the ICMM, the International Council on, on, on uh, Mining and Metals, uh, in Canada, the Mining Association of Canada is towards sustainable mining protocols. And there are many more. There is SASB, there is GRI, which are more global in terms of, I suppose, describing your impact and then disclosing around them. Uh, you know, my, my view is that the mining-specific protocols are always going to be more relevant. However, they're all underpinned by something common, uh, and that, that is when I say all, I mean GRI, SASB, ICMM reporting requirements, and MAC-TSM, 
which is ultimately to uh, more, I suppose, more specifically define the material topics to the company, those that are more critical to your operations. Obviously, uh, MAC, TSM, and the ICM are more prescriptive because they are purpose-built for mining. Those do evolve over time, and, and uh, as the industry standards improve and increase, those standards do in improve and increase. But there is nothing that can substitute a deep level of discussion around material topics to, to those stakeholders that are most critical to your business. And ultimately, it's coming down to those fence line communities where you need to maintain your license to operate and your investors who are where you're accessing capital. And ultimately, it's the topics that they're interested in would be deemed material. Uh, and therefore, that, that's really the focus that, that a mining company has to have. But all these standards speak to the concept of materiality. Uh, some go further and actually spell out what's material to you as a mining company. That, you know, again, MAC TSM is an example. And they have different levels of disclosure that one can go to based on where your performance is. Uh, so the standards world, there's no, there's no shortage of standards and guidelines around how to be disclosing and performing in the space at all. What is MAC TSM? Is that the Mining Association of Canada or is that something yeah. completely different? Yeah, no, Mining Association of Canada and TSM is there towards sustainable mining protocols, which while is the you know the Mining Association of Canada's protocols, uh, it's been adopted by many countries uh, outside of Canada. And of course, the intent and, and the way it works is if you're a Canadian listed company uh, and you sign on uh, to the Mining Association, uh, you will apply those standards across all your operations across the world. And so it really is an endeavor to drive a high, consistent standard of environmental and social performance wherever you operate. Okay, perfect. So if I'm a CEO of some two-person junior mining company, I can start with the MAC website, I guess, right? Yeah, you could. <laughs> you, you, you could. I mean, I think the thresholds for uh, the size of organization and when it makes sense to actually to delve into it fully, but there's no reason why you couldn't start as an exploration company looking at MACTSM and using that as guidance to inform how you operate, how you engage. Absolutely. I, I think that's incredibly valuable. Like, There's probably more than one CEO of an exploring mining company that listens to this podcast and who's thinking, this all sounds great, but what do I do? Yeah, <laughs> you know, so, absolutely. So that helps. That helps. Yeah. There's lots of guidance out there. I think I think it's about having again, especially if you if you're a junior exploration or junior mining company, it is all about having the in country people with the relationships with your fence line communities. That's always going to be the starting point for, for any activity from a mining perspective to drive the right level of engagement. Yeah, fair enough. So it's about your company values at the end of the day, which by default should be good and you show up and it's about treating the people around you well. And if you do that you're probably going to start to be in compliance with these things. Right? Well, you, you, you might not need the website so much. Or... Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's about getting that permission to operate. And to get that permission, you need to have a, a channel of communication that's authentic and accessible. And again, you know, of course, there are local regulatory authorities that you'll always need to be complying with and meeting with. But you could be in compliance locally. But if you haven't got that permission locally or that level of alignment right. to, to actually be operating in a region, uh, it doesn't matter what level of compliance you've met. The reality is you'll be, there'll be roadblocks, literally and figuratively. So Absolutely. Th that is always going to yeah. be the area you want to focus. Where's this heading? Like, do you guys have a kind of a two-year, three-year, five-year? Do you see where this is going? Is it just going to be more money? Like, instead of a third, it's going to be all money will be eventually ESG kind of vetted or all investments? Like, what's the future of this, or where do you see things going? Well, I mean, I do. I absolutely see that trend continuing of institutional capital uh, looking for cleaner, greener investments. That's not going to end. I think as, as long as there is a, a public demanding that, which there is, um, and investors who want to put their money in, in uh, I suppose, cleaner, safer, longer term bets, that, that is going to be the case. I think from a mining perspective, the challenge the industry has is along with, you know, thinking through digitizing and actually uh, performing well in the space. I think there is certainly room for mining companies to, to think about what it is they're mining and how that contributes to society. What is the actual end result in terms of societal impact and benefit? And, and we know mining has a massive positive impact on how we live in terms of the minerals that actually are produced to uh, to make steel, uh, you know, th there are minerals that go into almost all our critical goods that we use every day, uh, whether it be, you know, rare earth minerals in terms of communication devices, 
Um, I mean, the, the list is extensive, but very often investors and, and the public at large don't necessarily understand or see the link between a mining company and its actions and the, I suppose, services and the value to society that are generated from that. And there are some minerals and some types of mining that don't necessarily have as uh, high a benefit to society as perhaps they would have a decade or 20 years ago. And so I think that's going to be the challenge is being, in, you know, mining, uh, being in the space of mining a mineral that has value from a societal benefit perspective and making sure that your stakeholders are aware of what that benefit is. And just to maybe to, to add to that as well, I mean, a critical stakeholder here is also talent and, and mining companies, you know, live in a world which is, is staffed for talent. Uh, you know, you just look at the number of mining engineers that are sort of graduating every year or people that are actively choosing to come into this particular industry. And so, you know, while at the one end you've got the pressure from investors, you've got you know, pressure from kind of end consumers through through some of this, um, you know, value chain accountability that Henry's sort of talking about. What you also are going to need is, um, is ongoing talent to keep these operations going, to grow and expand and be able to serve these longer term needs of society. And so embedding these kinds of principles, um, embedding these kinds of systems and processes, I think also in turn attracts talent into, into this particular industry. I think historically mining has had a little bit of a bad rap, um, uh, you know, in amongst broader talent pools. And so, you know, in many of these big centers around the world, the whether or not uh, mining companies are competing against others, they're also competing against investment banks, consulting houses and, you know, capital markets, etc. And so attracting that talent and convincing that talent that these mining companies are aligned with some purpose, are aligned in making an impact uh, in the communities in which they operate is going to be critical to attract that talent. Yeah, that's so interesting that you say that. We had on two episodes ago, we had a mining recruiter, Eric Buckland, and I asked him, what is the job mining companies want to fill? And it's like, it, you said ESG, get an ESG person. And I think to your point, a lot of these graduates, you know, people, you know, mining doesn't have the best brand. It's not a glamorous brand right now. I think space and deep sea mining, a lot of things, I think there is opportunities to rebrand the space, so to speak, but I think the industry also has to take responsibility for, you know, a couple hundred years where things maybe weren't done so well. And, you know, so it, it evolves. So just to wrap up then, you guys are from Deloitte. Henry, you're the national leader of sustainability and climate change. Andrew, you're the global mining and metals leader. What does Deloitte bring to this conversation? And Henry, why don't you start? I think really what we bring to the conversation is making sure that our, our mining clients are as well prepared to succeed and grow and, and keep doing what they do effectively uh, in a way that they do attract investments, that the industry is viewed positively by its stakeholders. And so enabling them across a range of uh, initiatives where they need help is effectively where we slot in. A big part of that is helping them understand and working with them on what the emerging issues are so that they can really cast into the future and be future-proof around where things are headed. So from an ESG perspective, it's as you can imagine, it's very broad, but that's really where we focus in terms of enabling and helping our clients succeed. And maybe to add on to Andrew, what, uh, what Henry has said, yeah, I mean, you know, beyond, beyond actually operationalizing this for, for mining companies and, uh, and helping take them through this particular process, I think another big objective for us as Deloitte is also to make this global impact. And we want to be part of this change, which we believe is a positive change overall for the mining industry. And in order for this industry to survive, it is going to have to win the hearts and minds of investors and communities, governments, and, and the population at large. And, and I think uh, for us, it's, uh, it's critical to be to be part of that to be part of those dialogues and to be helping our mining companies you know globally enact that okay excellent so thank you very much henry stock national leader of sustainability and climate change in canada and andrew swart global mining and metals leader uh, thank you for joining us come back on the program sometime in the future would love to be back thank you thank you it's funny we were having Skype issues, and so they were calling me, so I sounded like the guest, the guy on the other side of the phone line, and they sounded like the host, so just trying to add a surreal touch, 
a little touch of unpredictability to your listening experience. And uh, not sure how I feel about that, but they were, I thought, really, uh, you know, I think you guys, I think everybody out there who's listening to this podcast is going to be some of the most informed people on the biggest issue facing the mining industry this year and last year and ongoing. So thank you once again for listening. Share it with your friends. Until next week, take care.